Section 4. Exclusive rights, infringements, defenses, and remedies. The owner of a registered trademark owns the exclusive right to use a mark. Well, that uh, might be a um, very good summary of the rights granted uh, to a trademark owner, or basically there's a right to use a mark. Right, it's a very good summary, but it's quite uh, uh, unclear. What is a use of a mark? So as we explained earlier, in order to maintain your exclusive rights in, in a registrable mark, you have to uh, use a mark in commerce. Otherwise, uh, that registration could even be cancelled. In other case, it is uh, and to establish infringements, you have to convince the courts that the defendants was using your mark as a trademark. Well, if the defendants merely use a mark, uh, use your regi registered mark uh, uh, for a painting, uh, for instance, uh, um, and, or, or for, uh, for a brochure, and, or, for, or, or your mark appeared in a movie. Uh, would that be infringement of your mark? Because uh, when you were uh, working on the streets or so watching um, movies, TV programs, you would always see uh, all kinds of logos over there. Sometimes um, uh, that without permission, having those uh, marks displayed in the public uh, could be infringement because that may amount to uh, using a mark in advertisements, right? But in other cases, uh, it might not be infringing. Uh, for instance, uh, if there's a TV program uh, talking about uh, um, how to drive safely, uh, and then they uh, use a car, for instance, uh, manufactured by BMW, of course, uh, and the BMW logo trademark would be uh, uh, visible, would be seen, displayed in the TV program. Would that be infringements of a trademark owner by BMW? Of course, uh, no. So the term of uh, use of trademark or trademark use uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, unclear. And well, the different kinds of uh, <coughs> legislation using the term trademark use or use as a trademark or use of a trademark uh, in different countries. Um, in the Chinese uh, trademark law, um, it says that, uh, well, the term use as a trademark or use of a trademark means the act of using a trademark on goods, on the packaging or a container of such goods, on documents for the transaction of such goods, in advertising and other publicity, in exhibitions and in other commercial activities in order to identify the origin of goods that's uh, and provided in Article 48 of the China Law of China. So the exclusive rights arising out of our China registration allow you to prevent all others from marketing identical or similar products under an identical or confusingly similar trademarks. Number one, basically, um, it's uh, quite, uh, well, there are um, visible variations in different legislations in different countries, but uh, generally speaking, the following uh, acts are covered by the trademark uh, rights. Um, Number one, using the trademark or affixing the trademark to goods or their packaging. Number two, using the mark for stocking, selling goods bearing the trademark or supplying services under the service mark. Number three, importing or exporting goods under the trademark. Number four, use the sign on invoice want list, catalog, business letter, business paper, price list, or other commercial documents, or use a sign in advertising. Well, 
in case number three or number C, you say applying trademark to goods or to materials for the lab labeling or packaging of goods in the territory registered solely for export purposes may constitute the trademark use, but this is a very great area in many countries. Basically, that's about trademark uh, use of OEM um, production uh, purposes because um, those products bearing those marks are not uh, to be sold in this country. It's mainly for export to other countries. And so can that be defined as uh, trademark use in this country? That's quite uh, controversial, even in China. Um, many local courts, even high courts in different provinces in China, uh, have been quite struggling with uh, this issue. And the Supreme Court's um, uh, ever um, issued a guiding case concerning this um, use of trademark for OEM production, but uh, and the rule is still not clear. Uh, so this issue is uh, more than a trademark legislation issue. It is uh, highly uh, relevant to international trade or trading policies uh, of a nation. So use uh, uh, a mark for advertising that's definitely infringing. However, those exclusive rights uh, are not without limits. Those limits uh, could uh, um, be generally general general limitations. Uh, for instance, uh, the country uh, or countries in which you have registered of mark. Um, otherwise, uh, a registered mark uh, would not be acknowledged by uh, the trauma office of another country where the mark not registered, right? The trademark registration is um, territorially um, limited unless um, what is registered uh, in uh, our community uh, registration system, for, for instance, uh, the European Union community mark. Um, or one more exception is the protection for well-known mark. Number two, the trauma reg registration is uh, protected only for the goods or services for which the trauma is registered. So uh, there are over 40 classes of goods or services uh, for the trauma registered for each class will be considered a separate trauma. It's also limited uh, to situations in which consumers are likely to be confused by the infringing trauma. To establish the trademark infringement, so you have to convince the courts that the defendants be using uh, your trademark, and that use uh, courts the consumer confused. Um, but that's also one more thing. For well-known mark, the protection uh, available for well-known marks is much more than consumer confusion. And that could be, um, for instance, in the U.S. law, uh, dilution protection for well-known marks and uh, additional protection for well-known mark on the Chinese law and also um, extensive protections for well-known marks in European unions. What is the trademark infringement? Of course, uh, without permission, from the trademark owner, any use of trademark defined under trademark law will be infringing the rights of uh, uh, trademark rights. The trademark rights are infringed when a competitor uses the same or confusingly similar trademark for the same or similar products in a country where the trademark is protected. So that's a general preposition, right? But what exactly does that mean? Well, under Chinese uh, trademark law, Article 47 give, uh, gives a, a list of uh, acts restricted by trademark rights. And uh, without permission, this is the infringements of uh, a registered uh, trademark. 
Number one, using a channel mark that is identical with a registered channel mark on the same goods without the permission of the channel mark owner. Number two, using a channel mark that is similar to a registered channel mark on the same goods or using a channel mark that is identical with also uh, with or, or similar to a, tram, a registered channel mark on similar goods which may easily uh, confusing without the uh, uh, permission from the channel mark registrant. Number three, selling goods that violates the exclusive rights to use a register of the channel mark. Number four, counterfeiting uh, or forging other channel marks, selling the counterfeited or arbitrarily forged uh, channel mark logos. Channel marks. Number five, uh, altering the uh, channel mark registrant. Um, without uh, the, the registered trademark without the authorization of the sim and the selling goods is bearing such a, a, a altered trademark. Number four, six, deliberately contributing to infringements or assisting others to commit infringements upon the exclusive rights conferred by a registered trademark. Number seven, other conducts caused to uh, prejudice to others' exclusive rights to use this uh, registered trademark. Well, that's a very. Um, well, 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 what what does that mean, right? Well, let's uh, um, have a a better translation or, or using the plain language. The like Article Fifty Seven of Trademark Law of China provides, generally speaking, seven conduct which may constitute trademark infringements, right? Number one, using a channel mark um, that identical to a register mark on identical goods or services. You see, identical mark on identical goods infringement. Number two, using an, a channel mark similar to a mark on identical goods or a channel mark identical or similar to a register mark on similar goods without permission and cause confusion that infringement you see here clause 2 says that similar trademark mark on identical goods or identical or similar trademark mark on similar goods plus cause of confusion Number three, selling counterfeiting products. Number four, counterfeiting or producing the labels of the registered trademark, mark, selling any such labels. Number five, you replace the products uh, you 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 replace the 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 trademark mark of the products offered on the marketplace by the trademark owner with um your own mark. That's also infringements of the trademark mark rights. Number six. That's a very uh, recent amendment to Chinese trademark mark law. That's basically about the secondary liability for contributing or encouraging uh, infringements. Apart from those um, civil liabilities defined under China law of China, there are a set of uh, uh, protections available uh, to China owners under criminal law of China. So, China infringements uh, can be criminal offenses. Article 213 define a crime of counterfeiting registered trademark without permission from the trademark owner use a trademark which is identical with the registered trademark on the same class of uh, commodities or goods or services that is uh, a, criminal, a criminal criminal offense uh, if that act may meet the threshold of uh, criminalization as defined uh, in this article. And uh, 
Article 214 defined the crime of selling goods bearing counterfeited registered trademark. Basically, it's a criminal offense to sell or offer for selling of uh, counterfeiting products online or on the street, provided that this acts uh, uh, may satisfy the threshold requirements defined under this article. Article 215 defined a crime of illegally manufacturing or selling illegally manufactured identifications of uh, or the labels or the label of uh, a registered trademark. So, to summarize, trademark infringements are, would arise uh, uh, only when rights to mark has been established for sure. So registration or use in commerce in different nations, right? The basic theory of infringement is the likelihood of confusion based on similarity of uh, infringing marks and goods. Uh, we will be back to those theories um, in the following slides. Those exclusive rights granted to trademark owners are number one, authorization of the production of uh, uh, goods, right? They, so uh, without permission, you make counterfeiting goods bearing the um, registered trademark, and that's a production of counterfeiting goods, that's infringement, but uh, there's a, um, requirements for the establishment, establishments of uh, these infringements, right? It must be for registered trademark, uh, identical or similar goods plus identical or similar marks. Number two, sales of uh, counterfeit products. Number three, production or sale of a counterfeit or counterfeit marks or labels. Number four, replacing the registered trademark with the new trademark and then put products bearing the new mark into market. Number five, assisted rule, assisted rule, or contributory or, or, or in, in inducements and liabilities for, for, uh, facilitating um, a trademark infringement by means of intentionally providing transport storage um, or even venue for manufacturing. So, Traditionally, to establish trademark infringements, the accused use of a trademark shall cause consumer to be or likely to be confused with the origin of a goods or services. It, the, it follows the very basic function of uh, the trademark. Uh, if you still remember why and the name of the maker of bricks of a great war were stapled to and the bricks made by him or her are simply to indicate uh, who should be responsible for these products, right? Well, and uh, the growing of the modern uh, trademark system basically um, being founded to or uh, being built upon this basic function of trademark to distinguish the goods of uh, its uh, uh, maker from those of uh, others. If uh, the uh, if the marks used by different producers of uh, goods or suppliers of services are so similar, and it's um, so difficult for consumers to tell the differences, uh, and then that is um, uh, would of course um, disable the marked to be functioning as an ident as an ident identifier of the source of the goods or services, right? So consumer confusion is a core requirement for the establishment of uh, uh, trauma infringements in a traditional sense. Uh, what is traditional? We will be back to this topic uh, to cover, um, for instance, the protection um, for well-known marks. Consumer confusion. Um, 
Well, it's uh, actual confusion plus likelihood of confusion. Right, the, the confusion can be that the competitors' products are the same as yours, or that the competitors' business is somehow associated with, or approved, authorized, or sponsored by your business uh, without your permission. The following fa uh, factors would uh, increase the likelihood of uh, confusion. Um, so it's quite simple to establish actual confusion if uh, there are strong evidences uh, uh, to support the claims of a patent or of a trademark owner, right? So uh, the most difficult uh, case um, are relevant to the determination of a likelihood of uh, confusion. It's possibly confusing, right? But uh, not for sure. But how to determine that uh, the uh, level of uh, confusion is uh, or may meet the requirements uh, um, under trademark law uh, as to likelihood of confusion. And the following factors to be considered by courts are number one, if you have a strong trademark, so the strength of a mark. So the stronger your mark is, the, the more distinctive your mark is, uh, the more uh, easily for you to establish um, trademark infringements. So the legal strength of the trademark is determined by, for instance, whether you have your mark registered, uh, particularly in the US. In China, of course, uh, you have to have it registered in order to sue the defendant for trademark infringements, and that's a general rule. And how distinctive the trademark is, right? Is it an offensive term or arbitrary or just a descriptive uh, term to um, sue the defendant uh, for trademark infringements upon a descriptive mark, uh, your mark must uh, uh, acquire secondary meaning. Number two, whether the two marks are similar. Number three, the similarities between the products are for you and your competitors. Um, whether your products are competing directly and or if there is evidence of actual confusion, if there are evidence of actual confusion, um, that's of course so would, uh, the, the, the opinion of the courts would be in favor of uh, the trauma owner. How to convince a court there's an actual confusion? A consumer survey is helpful to show public confusion. A consumer survey, of course, is also very helpful to convince the trauma office that their mark has acquired secondary meaning, uh, as what we learned from the leadership story uh, in China. If the products are marketed through the same marketing channels, so the marketing channels could be also a factor considered by the courts to establish uh, trauma infringements. Uh, timing of confusion. Usually, or traditionally speaking, to determine whether the consumer is confused, usually there's, uh, uh, the courts would focus on confusion at a point of a sale, right? As a, for instance, when this is usually apply, for instance, when you were in a supermarket trying to um, buy your products, um, and, and then when you see all those uh, catalogs, so those products over there, um, and, and then you were misled and picking up the wrong items, uh, and that's not what you exactly uh, wanted to buy. Uh, you were misled as a point of uh, making the choice uh, for buying that item, right? And that is uh, called uh, confusion as a point of uh, sale. That's uh, traditionally um, considered by the courts. But uh, while in recent years, um, recent decades, uh, marketing methods and uh, consumer search activities have expanded or the channels of uh, advertising uh, has been significantly expanded, especially with the internet. Right, the uh, temporal dimension of confusion has been uh, widened, 
and it's been expanded to, for instance, uh, initial interest confusion. So infringements can be based upon confusion that creates initial consumer interest. Even though any confusion is dispelled before the point of sale, even though the buyer were not, was not confused as a point of purchase, initial interest confusion affected the buyer's search and arguably influenced her or his purchasing decision. For instance, uh, you were searching using Google or Baidu or Jingdong, uh, Taobao, and trying to locate uh, um, uh, shoes, uh, for instance, um, um, or bearing a particular brand, and, and then you were uh, interested by those search results over there, uh, and some of the uh, result displayed there could be um, bearing the trademark of uh, another one's uh, mark. And then you, when you click on this, uh, that's advertisement, so even that item displayed on the search result page. Uh, and then the final page, right, it will take you to the web page of a seller of that item, and then the uh, web page to be displayed in the following steps say, is from a seller, um, or from a seller of uh, uh, products of uh, other brands. But uh, why you uh, choose uh, to click on that item, that, that search results, because you were initially uh, interested by that advertisement on the web page, or you actually were misled by that uh, information displayed on the search result page. Um, however, when you were taken to the exact web page or to exactly that seller in the next website, you realize that actually, oh yeah, that's not uh, um, a website on the, the seller here is not uh, um, the seller for a Chanel's product, for instance. Um, but wow, well, the products here looks um, not too bad. Well, although I was trying to looking for a Chanel product, but uh, uh, here, the product here is quite okay, right? So. And for this moment, when you make your decision to purchase the products from these dealers, uh, you were not confused, right? You were confused before you came to the seller. That's called initial interest confusion. Uh, of course, that's uh, quite uh, detrimental to the interest of, uh, uh, of the China owner. And post-sale confusion. Well, is confusion, uh, suppose that the consumer do not confuse two products as a point of purchase, but the, uh, third parties mistake the source of the purchased product from a distance. Why? Because for instance, uh, well, you, you bought a counterfeiting uh, or not gold for a for Chanel bag, uh, and when you were buying that bag online, you actually uh, knew that you were not paying the price of uh, an authentic uh, um, or products from Chanel. You actually were buying a uh, knockoff or a counterfeiting uh, products, a counterfeiting bag bearing Chanel's mark. Right. You were not confused at all. You were very clear about the uh, the, the 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 fact that uh, there's not uh, a product from Chanel. Right. You just bought, uh, you bought a copy. And that's what's your intention to buy a copy. And so you were not confused at all as a buyer of the product. But when you carry this bag, which bearing the trademark of Chanel and taking the public transport uh, like uh, the 
when you're sitting in the uh, uh, in the, on the bus or, or working on the streets, a third party, many others say, "Wow, that girl bearing carrying that bag uh, of Chanel," and and well, actually, actually, the the bag was not carried by you. It was not from Chanel, right? It's just a copy. But uh, any others around you might be misled, might be confused. It's uh, quite um, the creation of uh, confusion in this case, in the post-sale context, can be harmful in that if there are too many uh, knockoff, too many fake products on the market, sales of the original uh, products may, be, may decline because the public is fearful that uh, what they are purchasing may not be an original. Right. There are, could be other damages uh, uh, caused by this confusion to the trauma owner, particularly to those uh, uh, well-known marks. Types of, uh, types of confusion. Confusion as to source. Traditionally, uh, when we say the consumer is uh, confused. That confusion is uh, about uh, the source of the goods, right? Uh, counterfeiting products or passing off of goods as of those of another source that would uh, usually fall into this category. But uh, there are many other cases uh, where consumers will not believe that the trademark owner is the uh, one selling the product. The use of a similar trademark may still confuse them by causing them to believe that the trademark owner is affiliated with the, oh, is affiliated, is affiliated with the infringer's products so, or sponsored or the infringer's products is in supported or endorsed or sponsored by the trauma owner. For instance, when, when you were uh, free riding the reputation of a strong brand, or even the reputation of a celebrity, um, the public actually were quite aware of the fact that uh, the products were not made by uh, that brand. But uh, um, well, it might be possible that this was licensed by the, that brand, right? but it's sponsored by that, 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 that luxury brand, for instance, or by that celebrity. But you, uh, the infringer is taking advantage of the reputation or uh, or, or that connection or goodwill arising from the connection of another registered brand. Reverse confusion. Trauma confusion usually occurs when the um, an, a junior user chat, chat on the reputation of the uh, trauma owner, which means that uh, uh, the infringer is taking advantage of the reputation of a strong trademark. But in reality, it could also be possible that say, the owner of the strong uh, trademark uh, infringing on the trademark, uh, which is uh, um, not that uh, strong, or uh, infringing or taking advantage of a new brand without permission from that trademark owner. Right. We, let's say at times uh, a large company will adopt the mark of a smaller trauma owner. In this case, the danger is presumably uh, not that the junior user will trade on the smaller uh, company's goodwill. The risk instead is that the public will come to associate the mark not with its true owner, but with the, with the infringer. Why? Because the, the big company has spent a great deal of money to advertise it. And uh, then it means that uh, this uh, a new brand or this uh, small brand, uh, newly registered mark, will not have any future 
right? Because anyway, the public would uh, associate this brand with that big company, not uh, with your company, right? You, you, you are not that strong um, um, as that big company. So th this uh, kind of uh, confusion is called reverse confusion in the sense that say, the infringer is a trademark owner of a strong mark, uh, well-established mark, and uh, taking advantages of a weak mark or a new brand. Well, that's a traditional theory, right, for the protection of a trademark or, or to establish uh, trademark infringement based on so-called consumer confusion test. But uh, there are many cases uh, when nobody actually confused at all, right? Um, for instance, uh, here, for this, uh, this product on the left of the slides uh, in the middle, the Apple um, trademark or iPhone as a trademark were used for these products. You see, anyone would realize that. that would be aware of the fact that definitely these products cannot be offered by Apple company, right? Selling the smartphones, computers, right? Founded by uh, Stephen Jobs, right? But uh, obviously, the manufacturer or dealer of this product here in the case is taking advantage of the reputation of Apple company, reputation of iPhone, right? So, Nobody is confused at all, but uh, when the reputation of those marks uh, um, being right on, that uh, could be quite uh, unfair to the uh, trauma owners, particularly to the owners of well-known marks. It's also uh, misleading to consumers. Right? It, it's, it, it's not that it's just a harmful to trauma owners, it could also be harmful to consumers. Uh, Louis Vuitton and Toilet Seat. But this one here actually is, a, is from Louis Vuitton, but uh, um, here the point is that uh, for, if uh, there is someone using uh, a strong brand for selling or making uh, products, uh, that for outside the class of uh, uh, of goods or services services are registered by the trauma owner, and traditionally there's no confusion at all, um, because uh, the marks registered for different class of goods or services are different marks, but uh, in the case of uh, well known marks, uh, is uh, could be. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, unfair uh, to wear no marks. So, and um, there must be needs of uh, additional protection or stronger protection for wear no marks. And when the marks used by the public or competitor in the in uh, improper in improper way, and that for a long time that could uh, general side a trademark or the distinctiveness of a mark could be um, jeopardized. For instance, a Jeep as a trademark for that kind of vehicle and or aspirin, right, cell phone as we mentioned earlier. So the distinctiveness of a strong mark could be lost uh, or diluted uh, after many years of uh, unappropriate use of the mark. So they, all these uh, um, uh, acts should be um, forbidden or should be regulated in order to protect the, the reputation of those well-known marks. So additional uh, protection for well-known marks being established internationally and uh, implemented by many national legislations well-known marks uh, are trademarks that are considered to be well-known by the competence authority of the country where the protection for the trademark is sought. 
any types of trademark can become well known over time, well known marks generally benefit from additional protection. Um, internationally, in 1999, the WIPO General Assembly and the Assembly of the Paris Union adopted a joint recommendation concerning provisions on the protection of well-known marks, which provides guidance for determining whether a particular mark is well-known and determines the scope of protection of well-known marks. This joint recommendation is an effort taken by WIPO to bridge the gaps of uh, the Paris Convention and the TRIPS Convention. So this um, uh, joint recommendation basically responses timely to the rapid uh, and fast uh, change of, uh, um, the, uh, of the time um, of globalization, uh, international trade. Right, the rapid changes that take place in the field of intellectual property um, after the making of uh, TRIPS agreements and uh, Paris Convention. But in the United States, there is a separate line of theory being developed that's called the uh, trademark dilution. Um, the US Federal Trademark Dilution Act of 1996 was codified to protect um, Renault marks or famous marks in order to be protected under the Dilution Act, so the mark must be famous and an actual dilution must be dis displayed or must be established. Uh, just the likelihood of confusion is not enough. There are two types of uh, dilution. Dilution by blurring, the dis by blurring the distinctiveness of the famous mark or dilution by tarnishment um, making the well-known mark looks ugly, right? detrimental to the reputation uh, of the well-known mark. For instance, in the case of a Microsoft sandwich, well, dilution, trauma infringement, and trauma dilution are separate courts of action in the United States. And the following um, video here would give you a very brief introduction to the differences between trauma infringement and trauma dilution. And then after watching the video, we will be back to the topic of uh, an additional protection available to well-known trademarks under Chinese trademark law. Please keep in mind what's uh, being explained in this piece of video about the system uh, concerning trademark dilution in the United States. And keep this in mind, uh, compare the different uh, legislative approach taken by Chinese lawmakers because it is being also proposed that uh, China should uh, expand and the legal protection for well-known marks adopting um, the trademark dilution theories. But how different it is between um, the Chinese law um, and uh, the US law? Trademark infringement and trademark dilution are separate causes of action in trademark law and an infringement case from the Philippines is when McDonald's sued MacJoy, which is a fast food restaurant, and the question for the court, as is always the case in an infringement case, is is confusion likely for the average consumer? So the court looks at the similarity of the marks visually and in this case the court concentrated on the words McDonald's and McJoy separate from the colors and the design. Is there a visual similarity? Mm, there's a capital M, um, some visual similarity. Is there oral similarity? McDonald's, McJoy, mm, arguably some. Conceptual similarity may not be very useful here. McDonald's is a proper name. McJoy is, well it has the word joy in it 
but it's a made up word. Maybe not conceptual similarity, but arguably some visual and oral similarity. What about similarity of the goods and services? Now that's definitely there. These are fast food restaurants. Now, if you can demonstrate that the average consumer is likely to be confused, the remedies can include a legal order, an injunction, asking one of the parties to stop using the mark or damages, and registration of the mark will be blocked. In this case, McDonald's won the case and McJoy is no longer operating under that name in the Philippines. McJoy is now my joy. There's a new kind of trademark law, a cause of action in trademark law, that really only came of age in the 1990s and it doesn't replace infringement. Infringement is still the dominant cause of action for trademark enforcement, but dilution is for that small subset of marks that is well known to the public at large in a jurisdiction. So you would ask uh, in Singapore if the mark is well known to the public at large uh, in Singapore. So, you know, across different sort of classes and so on. And the question under dilution um, is if there is a lessening of the capacity of the trademark to identify and distinguish goods or services, regardless of whether there's any competition between the marks or any likelihood of confusion. So no competition, no confusion needed. The basic kind of dilution is blurring, where the distinctiveness of the mark is impaired by association with a similar mark. And the example of this that's used to illustrate it is from the Harvard Law Review, 1927. Schechter, a lawyer who thinks there should be trademark dilution as part of the trademark law, says, look, Rolls-Royce makes autos. What if Rolls-Royce was a mark that was used by all of these different products? If it, a different can company made Rolls-Royce candy and a different one opened a Rolls-Royce cafeteria and uh, still another one had Rolls-Royce pants. Well, maybe there'd be no competition between a pants manufacturer and a auto manufacturer. Maybe the public wouldn't even be confused. But Schechter was saying, look, we need a legal remedy in a case like this. There's another kind of dilution that is less common and that's called tarnishment. It's similar to blurring in that confusion and competition are not required like they are in infringement law, but the similar mark has inappropriate or unflattering associations. So for example, Victoria's Secret in the 1990s sued Victor's Little Secret, which is a retailer of adult novelty items. And Victoria's Secret argued, look, Nobody's confused between the two of us. They don't think we're related. There's no competition between us, but we have a strong mark that is tarnished by association with Victor's Little Secret. Now, the outcome in this case was quite complex, but it's a good example of the kind of case that would occur under tarnishment. So you see that there are two basic causes of action that we've talked about so far in trademark law. Infringement, where we ask about confusion and we ask about competition. And then dilution, which is for well-known marks. And confusion and competition are not required here. We simply ask if there are similar marks being used on any goods or services, whether or not they are similar. Fair use is a defense to dilution, and it's, it's different than the fair use defense for copyright. It includes these possibilities, um, comparative advertising, when I mention another brand in my advertising, or parody and other kinds of non-commercial purposes, where I'm merely talking about another brand. News reporting or commentary, which we see all the time. We see reporting on the new iPhone. Um, there's no need to worry uh, about trademark infringement in cases like that, or trademark dilution either. In these cases, we're not even using the trademark for goods and services. So there's certainly no possibility of infringement. We're not competing uh, by talking about the iPhone. And uh, there's no possibility of dilution either. 
Finally, good news for folks who didn't register their trademark. Let's say that I open a small restaurant in Jurong East, and I call it Mark's Diner, and a competitor opens a Mark's restaurant, and I think I'm being taken advantage of. Well, even if I didn't register my Mark, I can demonstrate to the court that there's goodwill attached to the mark and uh, I can allege that there's misrepresentation, to, there's deception, that these, this other mark is trying to take advantage of the goodwill associated with my mark and if I can convince the court that there's been damage, probable or real, to my brand, I may have a legal remedy. Well, through this um a video the professor explained clearly the differences between um, trademark infringements and the trademark dilution under the US law um, and this scenario being quite influential internationally so the protection for well-known marks have been formulated in many countries based on the theory from the US um, but anyway the course of action of uh, trauma infringement is still the dominant uh, uh, litigation or the dominant course of action for uh, the protection of uh, trademark. In China, trademark infringement and in, in China we have uh, um, a quite uh, different system for the protection of uh, well-known marks. Uh, this uh, international, uh, the international law or the recommendations of by the WIPO uh, did not give uh, very specific uh, guidance uh, on what kind of uh, uh, protection should be available for well-known marks or how strong the protection should be for well-known marks. So the current Chinese legislation provides uh, that the well-known marks uh, are protected uh, um, but uh, it's following the scenarios uh, identified here in the trademark law of China. Uh, first of all, in order to be qualified for um, a stronger protection, the mark must be well known. Whether the mark of a well known uh, is determined um, not to, uh, the recognition of uh, whether a mark is well known is not usually initiated by the trademark office or by the courts it would always be upon the request of the trademark owner in a given case. The case could be, uh, could be about uh, trademark infringements or it could be uh, administrative protection um, for a mark or it could also be in the process of, uh, of raising an opposition uh, or objecting and, and a, trademark infringement, a trademark registration with the trademark office. So here, um, the pro uh, prohibition of using the wording well known mark or for commercial activities so means uh, um, previously, uh, when a trademark owner is protected by the courts or by the competent uh, administrations, they would uh, market their brands as a well-known mark, um, but uh, the legislators uh, they see that as uh, they so whether it's a well-known mark is not a uh, uh, kind of endorsement from the courts or from the uh, administration for your brand is merely for the purpose of uh, setting of solving the disputes in a given case uh, to determine whether extensive or additional protection should be available for that brand in the case. So generally speaking, an additional protection for well-known marks uh, may fall within two scenarios. Uh, number one, um, protection for a well-known mark that's not registered in China. Not registered but famous, but, but well-known in China, right? Number two, are registered in China and then become famous. So it's a registered, a well-known mark in China. The 
um, protection available to the two categories of well-known marks are quite different. To determine whether a mark is well-known or not, the following factors shall be considered as the trademark law uh, provided. The number one, the degree of uh, uh, notoriety, notoriety of the trademark among the relevant the public, whether it's a, uh, basically the strength of the mark, but, uh, whether it's a, a very distinctive mark or how many years it's been used. Right, the length, number two, the length of continuous use of the trademark. Number three, um, the continuous length, degree, and the geographical scope of uh, any publicity of for the uh, trademark. Uh, how much, uh, how extensive uh, this brand uh, being advertised. Uh, number four, the record of uh, protection of the mark as a well-known mark. So if this uh, mark being acknowledged as a uh, a well-known mark in other cases, and they uh, recognition could be a factor to be considered by, in this case, but it's not always accepted because whether it's well-known, whether the trademark mark in case is well-known or not, it's not, uh, the answer is not um, without change, with the change of time, for instance, this mark could be very well known 10 years ago, but it's not well known now, right? This mark could be um, not well known five years ago, but it is already well known today. That's why, um, the, the, that's why whether a mark is being accepted as a, and recognized as a well known mark in another case, by another court or by another uh, administration, uh, is merely factors to be considered for uh, the uh, answer to be, uh, for the questions to be answered in this case. Number five, other factors associated with the trend marks uh, uh, being well known or not. So the well-known trend mark recognition would uh, take place uh, in the following three um, circumstances. Number one, and a well-known uh, whether a well a mark is well known could be determined by uh, the trauma office or by the administrative uh, uh, authorities uh, for protection of uh, marks. Number two, it can also take place. in the process of a trademark, you know, trademark registration. For instance, uh, somebody trying to register Lenovo, for instance, as a trademark for class uh, 11, for instance, or for tea, or for soft drinks, right? And then the Lenovo company, the uh, brand owner of a Lenovo, Lenovo trademark uh, may recent opposition to that uh, uh, to that uh, registration application on the ground that's a look and that would be th this uh, registration would be detrimental to my mark which is a well-known mark and although um, my mark not registered with the class 11 products but if this registration allowable that would be uh, harmful or detrimental to the reputation of uh, my well-known mark Lenovo. And then the trademark office or the TRAB would uh, review whether the Lenovo the mark is well-known enough or not. If uh, it can be recognized as a well-known mark, uh, then this proposed registration will be denied. Number three, in case of uh, trademark infringements uh, and concerning civil litigations in the court and all trademark administrative lawsuit, right, the court would have the authority to determine whether a mark in case is well known or mark well known or not. Right, uh, for instance, the defendant in this case is. Uh, 
the maker of a tea products or soft drink products using the brand the Lenovo, whether that's infringing the rights of uh, uh, Lenovo, the China owner, and and uh, it's uh, the China owner here for Lenovo would also be able to make a request to the courts for determining whether my mark is uh, well known or not. If it's a well-known mark, and then the defendant would be infringing. If not, the defendant would not be infringing. So whether uh, in any specific case, the court, the mark could be recognized uh, and accepted as a well-known mark, uh, whether, it's, whether the establishment of a well-known mark can be guaranteed is crucial for the protection of the trauma owners. So that's uh, basically uh, about uh, um, well no mark protection. And uh, one more thing here on the current uh, Chinese trademark law, as we explained earlier, there could be two possibilities uh, of uh, un of well known marks. Number one, a registered well known mark, which means uh, the trademark registered in China, but and meanwhile, uh, it's also well known. Right? In this case, uh, if a registered well known a trademark under Chinese trademark law, and the uh, protection would be very strong. And the protection, uh, it means that uh, the trademark owner of this mark would have the right to stop the use of this well-known mark for any classes of goods that could be confusing or could be detrimental to the reputation of uh, the trademark owners. Uh, number two. If uh, this mark is not registered in China, but is well known in China, for instance, uh, there could be a uh, a mark uh, um, registered in Japan or in Europe, um, but is quite famous, well known in China, but that foreign mark is not registered in China, right? The traditional theory says that that's a that's a foreign trademark should not be recognized and protected in China, but uh, here in this case. Uh, it's not registered in China, but well known in China. Um, well, in this case, if uh, the foreign China owner may convince the relevant the competent authorities, for instance, the China office or, or the China administration or, or the courts in, uh, in the uh, litigation, that um, my mark is not registered in China, but it's a uh, well known in China. If this can be established, uh, then uh, under Chinese trademark law, the trap this foreign trademark owner would uh, have rights to stop others from using this mark for the same classes of goods, but cannot stop others from using this mark for other classes of goods. So you see the different levels of uh, uh, protection available to a registered well-known mark and unregistered well-known mark under the current uh, Chinese law. But this distinction is quite arguable. Someone proposed that uh, this distinction should be uh, abolished, but that will be the decision to be made by the lawmakers. Uh, um, well, the next topic is um, defenses uh, to infringement accusations, as we explained in previous lectures. Any intellectual property rights are not conferred on the rights owners without limitations. Right? There are all kinds of limitations. For instance, in the case, uh, it could be possible that uh, um, the defendants, the accused infringer, defends that, uh, well, look, uh, what I'm doing, uh, uh, what I was doing, I shall not fall within the scope of uh, infringing acts defined under uh, trademark law or patent law or copyright law, right? They're simply not infringing acts established here, right? Of course, that's a, uh, that's a defense. But the defense is uh, we are talking about here. Um, it's um, much narrow. Uh, it's about the limitations uh, to the exclusive rights granted to the rights owners. So here, 
uh, very similar to uh, copyright law or patent law is the exhaustion of uh, trademark rights or for sale doctrine. Once a trademark owner or licensee sells a trademark goods, the buyer of that goods is free to resell the goods without permission of the trademark owner. The first sale doctrine, however, applies only to authorized sale of a genuine uh, products, uh, not uh, for the sale of for counterfeiting products, for sure. Of course, uh, similar to the issue of uh, uh, exhaustion of uh, patent rights, uh, whether the exhaustion of uh, trademarks is internationally applicable or nationally, uh, or is international or, or exhaustion or national exhaustion, the answer to um, exhaustion of uh, patent rights under Chinese patent law is quite clear, right? That is international exhaustion. But apart from patent law, the copyright law and trademark law haven't given any clear guideline uh, guidance on this issue. But why? Because this is a modern uh, legislative arrangement. So it's uh, um, quite um, relevant to the reality of uh, manufacturing industry and uh, the national policy towards international trade and the protection of uh, domestic uh, consumers. Trademark fair use is another set of uh, limitations uh, um, available to, uh, to the use, users of a trademark. Traditionally, it may cover descriptive fair use and uh, a nominative fair use. Descriptive uh, fair use is the classic fair use defense concerns the good fit use of a mark for its primary or descriptive meaning rather than its secondary meaning, which is uh, when consumers associate a particular term or mark with a particular um, products provided or brand. And secondly, Nominative uh, fair use. It's a use of a trademark mark to name the products of the real owner of the mark. For example, a car dealer uses BMW to inform the public that the BMW cars are available in the shop. Now also, comparative advertising may also amount to a nominative use uh, of a trademark. mark. Well, actually, whether there is a trademark mark uh, fair use theory uh, quite uh, arguable because why those um, so-called uh, fair use defense to trademark infringements could also be interpreted as uh, acts that fall outside the scope of uh, the exclusive rights of uh, trademark owners, right? Simply it's not uh, trademark use. Now, if you're using, for instance, uh, uh, say, uh, for instance, you were a dealer for um, for BMW cars, right? You simply um, use displays the, the trademark mark of BMW and in, in in your shop, right? And or in the places where you have your business, uh, informing the public public that uh, come on and what I'm selling is BMW cars, right? Simply uh, descriptive or, or nominative, right? This, in this case, it's a nominative to name the products uh, being sold by you, and you were using uh, the name, that's a BMW, that's the trademark, mark, uh, um, not to uh, telling the public that uh, a BMW, this product from me, BMW is from me, right? Uh, simply, the cars bearing the trademark, mark, BMW trademark, mark, right? That from, of course, that's uh, German manufacturer motor cars, but um, uh, so, but you have to use it, right? Otherwise, how can you name the product you were you were selling, right? And they're all different brands of cars, right? The brands you were selling is BMW, right? In this case, it's um, not infringement, so, but uh, whether so that's purely theory theoretical issues, right? And here, um, 
the current legislation basically says that those acts are not uh, considered as a trademark infringements on the Chinese trademark law. But how about the U.S. law? There is a separate uh, article concerning trademark fair use, descriptive use, and nominative use. Is there a concept of fair use in trademark law? I'm Angela Langlotz, trademark and copyright attorney, and I'm gonna answer that question in the next five minutes. So I had someone message me, Ryan Euler, and I'm gonna tag him in this. I'm trying to hold up this law book, and it's a little bit heavy. <laughs> I'm gonna move it. Um, Ryan wanted to know this. He said, I have a question about trademark infringement. I've been reading up on the fair use of trademarks, and I'm a little confused about a few things. I make online training videos for Marine Electronics and want to know what my rights are concerning them. I primarily make training videos that show how to use and operate Lawrence fish finders. I know that the fair use protects me for copyright material, but I don't know about trademark materials. What are my rights? <laughs> well, Ryan, you'll be glad to know that the Lanham Act, that's our trademark law, specifically addresses this. So why don't we do a reading from the code. What it says is, and this is section 1115B4, and it says, use of the name, term, or device charged to be an infringement is a use otherwise than as a mark or a term or device which is descriptive of and used fairly and in good faith only to describe the goods or services of such party or their geographic origin. What does that mean translated into plain old English? <laughs> it means that if your use of the trademark is just to describe something that you're otherwise talking about, that is not a violation of someone else's trademark rights. You have the right to say, I'm gonna show you how to use this Lawrence fish finder in this video, and I'm gonna highlight some of the features. In fact, if I were the Lawrence company, I would be really, really grateful that someone out there was doing a better job of teaching and training about how to use my products and possibly inducing people to sell my pro or, you know, to buy my products. Um, I would be grateful for that rather than hitting them with a copyright lawsuit. But I've seen companies do all kinds of crazy stuff in this regard. You know, they've, they've gone to people who are like, you know, doing videos about their their products and threaten them with, with lawsuits and things like that. I mean, these companies truly are kind of crazy and sometimes they don't think through this stuff very, very well. But if someone is making videos about how to use your product and they're not claiming to be from your company and they're not trying to confuse the consumer into thinking that the video was sponsored by your company, well, shoot let them, <laughs> they're actually doing you a favor. So Ryan, I think that what you should do is, um, and this is not legal advice, I haven't seen your videos, so I don't know what you're doing, but um, I think to be safe, you might put, if you're putting the videos up on YouTube, for example, you might put at the bottom that, hey, this is just my opinion about uh, how to use this product, and these videos aren't sponsored by the companies named in the video. I'm just doing these to, um, you know, to help people. Anyway, that's the disclaimer I would make just to be safe and to avoid any accusation that you're trying to confuse the consumer into thinking that your videos are like official company training or anything like that. But yes, there is a concept of fair use in trademark law. It's sometimes called nominative use, like you're just naming um, the product in a video or other promotion or doing a comparison or something like that. You have the right to do that under the trademark law so long as you're not trying to confuse the consumer about the source of the goods or services. So I hope you found this useful and if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to find me online at facebook.com forward slash trademark doctor. You can message me more questions there. You can also find me at trademarkdoctor.net and I have a whole channel on YouTube where I do use other people's trademarks as examples in case studies all the time and no one has contacted me or sent me a nasty letter about that. So I will see you later and please message me with any trademark or copyright questions. Okay, so trademark in fair use defense.
includes generally generally two types of uh, fair use, right? Descriptive fair use and a nominative uh, fair use of trademark. But uh, keep in mind that this uh, uh, just um, uh, the key uh, differences uh, we explain here, uh, in, including the exhaustion of trademark rights. Apart from those, uh, there could be other defenses. For instance, a prior use defense under Chinese law and other uh, potential defenses. And our next topic is the remedies uh, for trademark infringement. So there are all kinds of remedies uh, for trademark infringements, of course, for instance, uh, um, criminal uh, remedies uh, or remedies on a criminal law. It is a criminal offense to and make and sell counterfeiting products uh, under specific uh, circumstances uh, defined on the criminal law of China. In addition, um, selling or making uh, counterfeiting products could also be punished by uh, administrative authorities or by the, the infringing products uh, could be seized and destroyed, burned by the customs. Um, but here, uh, we want to focus on remedies available uh, from the courts. So the courts uh, may apply the following uh, remedies. Uh, number one, order to cease the infringement. So that's uh, stop doing infringing acts as an injunction. Number two, confiscate the infringing goods, materials, as well as the tools and the equipment used in the protection of infringing uh, goods. Number three, pay damages or all the damages to be paid to the trauma owner. The most difficult part is the calculation of damages uh, in the case of established trademark infringements. The uh, two 2013 amendments uh, to China's uh, trademark law has significantly improved the scenarios uh, for the calculation of uh, damages. Uh, in the case uh, number one, it says uh, uh, damage is available to uh, uh, and trauma owner should be based on the actual losses suffered by the trauma owner, but you have to prove it right without evidence. So how can you convince the court that how much losses are suffered by you? Uh, quite difficult. Number two. Profits made by the infringer attributable to infringement. So of course, you have to prove it. The plaintiff have to pr prove it. It's also basically like a mission impossible because how can you uh, have a clear message or information or uh, about uh, the exact profits made by the infringer attributable to his or her infringement? And that was the uh, two major scenarios for the calculation of uh, damages uh, in the old law, but uh, and in practice, uh, even the courts uh, were complaining that uh, look, it is simply not possible in any case to mm, to establish uh, uh, the facts um, or uh, based on the calculation scenarios uh, under the law. And so over ninety five percent of in over ninety percent of cases, so the court would have to apply statutory damage rules to uh, to just uh, determine uh, to just uh, to, uh, uh, to to impose um, um, very insignificant amount of damages uh, on the infringers. Uh, because uh, the, uh, you, the plaintiff, cannot establish uh, uh, the facts that how much uh, actual losses you suffered or how much the profits are made by the infringer, right? So we have to uh, rely on the statutory damages. So, uh, the statutory damages, of course, in many cases, is, uh, is not enough to afford uh, sufficient uh, um, protections to infringements. Well, so the 2013 amendments added a few more scenarios for the calculation of damages. For instance, number three, multiples of royalties. If you as a trauma owner may convince the courts with your previous transactions, licensing agreements, 
uh, signed with other uh, licensees says that look uh, for this kind of for trademark license uh, I would usually usually charge like a one million uh, for each city for the use of my mark and so here in this case uh, this guy should pay me like a two or five million well usually uh, the courts um, would uh, have reason to adopt uh, your proposition number four punitive uh, damages that's also uh, quite um, n quite newly added into the law um, it says uh, basically if uh, the infringer is a repeat infringer uh, very bad infringer and that guy could be punished uh, um, by uh, imposing one to five times of uh, damages um, Number five, uh, of course, statutory damages up to uh, five million RMB. Well, this is uh, basically uh, what we have for trademark law in China. We have done a quite extensive uh, uh, exploration of uh, the uh, trademark legislation in China from a comparative uh, perspective to see uh, what the differences and similarities between the legislative approaches taken by the Chinese lawmaker, the US lawmaker, and the lawmakers in other countries. Uh, this is not a comprehensive comparative studies of course, given the limits of times of this course. But if you do um, have an interest in the trademark law in China, you can just feel free to let me know.